Well, I think we'll get underway. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the 45th Strain Group meeting. I'm the director, John Davis. Uh, tonight, we are so fortunate uh, to host Lord Moore of Etchingham to mark the 30th anniversary of the fall of Margaret Thatcher, one of the most remarkable events of modern political and governmental history. They say everyone remembers uh, where they were when JFK died. Well, I was in a sixth form politics class out in Hornchurch at Abs Cross Comprehensive uh, in Essex, when one of our particularly left-leaning history teachers burst in with the news that Thatcher had fallen. Uh, to this day, I can still see that uh, quite weird mixture of glee and some awe, actually, uh, about what had just happened. Uh, this event also marks the paperback publication, the third and final of Lord Moore's extraordinary authorised biographies. Uh, this one subtitled Herself Alone, all three absolutely essential for our number 10 partnered classes here at King's. To kick this evening off, we are delighted to welcome back to King's Robert Orchard, who in 1990 covered the whole affair for the BBC. Ro uh, Robert, you're most welcome. Thank you, John, and I'm delighted to be taking part in this Strand Group session, both as a political journalist who covered this momentous event, as you say, and also as a former very mature MA student of John's at King's a few years ago. It seemed to me that an event marking the dramatic fall of Mrs. Thatcher would be incomplete without seeing and hearing from the Iron Lady herself. So I put together a rudimentary, a very rudimentary TV style report of how this historic event came about. With enormous assistance from my two producers and picture editors, the excellent Greg Owens in Cardiff and Martin Stolliday for Kings. So bear with us please for any technical gremlins. We can't promise to be as slick as the TV news. Now, the political assassination of Margaret Thatcher in broad daylight is still probably Britain's most dramatic political story since the war. But it's three decades since the Conservatives bundled out of office their triple election winning prime minister. And for many people, as John was saying, it now seems almost a historical event. She's a historical figure, almost like Lloyd George, Attlee, even Churchill. But for many of us who lived through the 1980s, she was very real. Love her or loathe her, and there were few voters who had no opinion. The Iron Lady was a force of nature who dominated British politics for a decade, and her stunning fall in November 1990, which I covered as a BBC political correspondent, split her party, inflicting wounds that some say have yet to heal 30 years on. Mrs Thatcher had been the dark horse candidate who had vanquished Ted Heath to become Conservative leader. It meant an uneasy start to her premiership. Her first cabinet included many one nation party grandees, the so-called wets, who mocked and opposed her. Two of her most able ministers were Geoffrey Howe, her first chancellor, and Michael Heseltine, an impulsive, charismatic figure and party conference favorite. Back then, both men cheered her uncompromising message. I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies not for turning. Mrs. Thatcher routed her political enemies and won the second election, but trouble was looming with Michael Heseltine. A passionate pro-European, he fought for the ailing Westland Helicopter Company, but felt he was gagged from setting out his solution in a crucial cabinet meeting. That was the point at which I folded my papers and said that I have no place in this cabinet. I have resigned from the cabinet and I will make a full statement later today. If you're going to have a cabinet, then you better have collective responsibility and a hell of time wasn't prepared to live by it. Um, he was prepared to die by it as he did. Oh, I think that there's no doubt about it, that we actually expected him to cause trouble. <laughs> Bernard Ingham was right. As Mrs Thatcher's irascible press secretary predicted, Michael Heseltine did cause trouble, prowling the back benches for nearly five years, the king across the water, as rumblings grew about Mrs Thatcher's abrupt style, the lapses of judgment and rudeness to colleagues. Rudeness, particularly to the mild mannered Sir Geoffrey Howe, who seemed to irritate her more and more. By now, Foreign Secretary, Howe was another Euro enthusiast like Heseltine. He and Nigel Lawson, his successor as Chancellor, sat in pride of place next to their leader in the official cabinet photo for 1989. 
but their efforts to ambush Mrs. Thatcher into backing their wish to join the ERM, precursor of a European single currency, backfired. Howe was shocked when Mrs. Thatcher demoted him to a junior cabinet post. He was also furious to learn the identity of his replacement, the relatively junior and little-known John Major, Mrs. Thatcher's latest protege. But Major would soon be on the move again to replace Nigel Lawson at the Treasury in the latest round of cabinet musical chairs. Mrs. Thatcher had called Lawson unassailable, but he resigned, rocking the government by claiming she'd undermined his authority. Other cabinet ministers closed ranks despite feverish talk of a leadership challenge, and Michael Heseltine judged the time wasn't right. Instead, it fell to Sir Anthony Meyer, a quixotic Europhile patrician, to offer himself as a stalking horse candidate, asking his fellow MPs, do we want to fight the next election with a leader who claims infallibility? That struck a chord with as many as 60 Tory MPs who didn't back the Prime Minister, though she still won easily enough. The government's Machiavellian political fixer, the late Tristan Garrell-Jones, helped get out the vote for his leader, but he warned the PM many more MPs were close to breaking ranks. I think my departing phrase was, don't forget, there are 100 assassins lurking in the bushes, and in a year's time they're going to come out and kill you. But Mrs Thatcher wasn't in a listening mood. There was rioting in central London in spring 1990 over the controversial poll tax, the community charge, and growing protests even in true blue Kent and Surrey over its alleged unfairness. Many Tory MPs voiced their growing concern, but Mrs Thatcher refused to abandon her flagship policy. And in the Commons, the Prime Minister stepped up her increasingly strident opposition to European integration. The President of the Commission, Mr Delors, said at press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic body of the community, he wanted the Commission to be the executive, and he wanted the Council of Ministers to be the Senate. No! Yeah. No! Yeah. No! Well, how, bruised and humiliated by another tongue-lashing in Cabinet, enough was enough. Two days later, he resigned. His departure caused few serious ripples immediately, so when MPs and journalists crowded into the Commons chamber and press gallery to hear his resignation statement, few of us were expecting verbal fireworks. After all, Howe had never managed to quite shrug off the stinging jibe by Labour bruiser Dennis Healy, that being attacked by him was rather like being savaged by a dead sheep, but not that day. How ruthlessly mocked what he called the nightmare image sometimes conjured up by my right honourable friend, who seems who seems sometimes to look out upon a continent that is positively teeming with ill-intentioned people, scheming in her words to extinguish democracy. Listening grimly, Mrs. Thatcher, John Major, and Party Chairman Kenneth Baker, as behind them. Howe denounced the PM's hostile rhetoric on Europe in terms he thought the cricket-mad major might appreciate. It's rather like sending your opening batsmen to the crease, only for them to find, the moment the first balls are bowled, that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. <laughs> the effect was electrifying. Michael Heseltine declared he would challenge Mrs. Thatcher, promising to scrap the hated poll tax. His chances were bolstered by favourable opinion polls, while a shambolic campaign for Margaret Thatcher saw her support ebbing away. Hugh Edwards was another BBC political correspondent covering the leadership race. There were epic levels of hypocrisy involved. Lots of the people I interviewed were incredibly strong in favour of Mrs Thatcher publicly, but once you switch the microphone off, they were viciously critical and begging her to leave. Mrs Thatcher did leave, but only to attend a major conference in Paris, instead of staying to urge wavering MPs to support her. Mrs Thatcher is in Paris, where she's carrying on with the business of an international summit. For Mrs Thatcher, three days in Paris to mark the formal ending of the Cold War are a welcome respite from political pressures at home. I said, don't go to Paris for this meeting, but stay in London, and I'll bring in MPs to talk to you, and you must talk to them and persuade them to support you. And she said, Kenneth, I've won three elections. I haven't got to do that again, have I? She had to do it again. Party chairman Kenneth Baker was right. 
On the first ballot, Mrs. Thatcher fell just four votes short of winning outright. Hearing that news, the PM bustled straight out of the British Embassy in Paris to try to steady her supporters' nerves. Mrs. Thatcher, could I ask you to comment? Uh, good evening. Good evening. Where's the microphone? It's here. This I'm is the microphone. I'm actually very pleased that I got more than half the parliamentary party and disappointed that it's not quite enough to win on the first ballot. So I confirm it is my intention to let my name go forward for the second ballot. Is Back at Westminster next day, there were desperate attempts to shore up the Thatcher campaign, but support was ebbing away. Most of the cabinet now believed Mrs. Thatcher would lose to Heseltine in the second ballot. They were summoned to her office in the Commons to meet her, one by one. They'd cheered Mrs. Thatcher at party conference for years, but not today. The pugnacious Ken Clark told her bluntly her campaign to survive was like the charge of the light brigade. Peter Lilly, a fervent supporter, said it was inconceivable that you will win. Malcolm Rifkind, no Thatcherite he, warned the Prime Minister she was holed below the waterline. Even John Wakeham, her reluctant campaign manager, was saying the PM was living in cloud cuckoo land, though not to her face. If she stood down, nearly all agreed, other ministers could enter the race and keep Heseltine out. A late night visit to Downing Street by younger supporters urged Mrs. Thatcher to stay and fight on, but now she seemed resolved to go, though she still planned to sleep on it. 9 a.m. on Thursday, the 22nd of November, in the cabinet room stood empty as ministers gathered expectantly outside, summoned for a special meeting. Once all was seated around the famous coffin-shaped table, Mrs. Thatcher read out a short resignation statement, breaking down, but then <coughs> continuing. Some of her all-male cabinet were also tearful. A private secretary recalls Home Secretary David Waddington mopping his eyes with a large white handkerchief. When the news was announced minutes later, it stunned the nation. And Mrs. Thatcher's supporters weren't the only ones to be dejected by her decision. About half past ten, I heard the news on the radio that she had decided to stand down. And I knew at that time I would not win the next round. Uh, I had become very divisive in the Conservative Party, quite understandably. The day that Margaret Thatcher resigned as leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister, Labour's best asset went through the door. Little known John Major, the Thatcher protégé, and Douglas Hurd immediately entered the race. Both promised they too would radically change the poll tax. In just five days, John Major's slick campaign saw him surge into the lead. And on Tuesday, the 27th of November, after the second ballot saw Heseltine and Heard concede, John Major emerged into Downing Street to greet the world's media, including me on the right in the red scarf, live on Radio 4, with our next Prime Minister. Next day, Margaret Thatcher left Downing Street, her home for more than a decade, in what was clearly for her a highly emotional farewell. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years. And we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. So Mrs. Thatcher was gone. Britain's longest serving modern prime minister. She'd won back the Falklands, humbled the miners, curbed trade union power, privatized gas, water, telecoms, and won three elections. Yet she was brought down by her own MPs who feared she'd lose them their seats at the next election. The victim of a party renowned for its ruthless focus on winning and retaining power above all else. A warning Boris Johnson might do well to heed. Mrs. Thatcher stayed too long. She became too isolated, too difficult to work with. The disastrous poll tax helped undo her, though her hostile attitude to Europe and the EU ambitions was the key issue for many in the cabinet. Nowadays, though, her European views would probably be mainstream in Boris Johnson's Conservative Party. Many believe the aftershocks from the humiliating way she was ousted continued for decades. And Margaret Thatcher never really forgave her cabinet colleagues for their forthright advice that fraught November day. It was treachery with a smile on its face.
Margaret Thatcher, Maggie, the Iron Lady, a very controversial figure in British politics, but a hugely significant one, certainly, and a far cry from the rather one-dimensional caricature of her, now on show in The Crown on Netflix. Back to you, John. Thank you so much, Robert. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful. Certainly brings back some memories. Okay, Charles, welcome back to the Strand Group. You are so welcome. Um, let's kick off. Um, what's your appreciation of this tumultuous time? Well, um, people say that um, it was inevitable that this would happen to Mrs. Thatcher. I don't think that's quite right. Um, I think she, uh, if it had been handled differently, uh, she could have won um, that first ballot. Uh, and then um, she would, in the short term, have continued as prime minister. So um, the particular way that it happened um, didn't have to be that way. But it's interesting that it did happen that way because it shows that the thing was falling apart, that the organisation um, wasn't good enough anymore. And you have to ask yourself why. And I think the key to it is that the, a lot of the parliamentary party and above all, the top of the parliamentary party were sick of her. Um, and so when you look at these leadership races, you have to get a bit granular. You can talk about very wide issues that are going on through the country and they matter very much, poll tax, Europe and so on. Um, but you also have to think about what those individuals were thinking. And um, I think what they were thinking is, um, she, it's, we've had enough of her, um, or we're fed up with her and we need to um, find a decorous way of moving on. Now, unfortunately for them, it wasn't decorous, but I think that's what they thought. Um, and what they tried to do. And when I say they, I don't mean the people who fossil, followed Michael Heseltine so much. I mean the people who were actually in the government and still in theory supporting her. But I think they'd learned from the previous uh, year that the challenge by Anthony Mayer in 1989, um, that things were not good. And they made a sort of tacit decision that she was on the way out. And I think I found a document by Tristan Garrell Jones who was deputy chief whip in 1989. Um, which made that clear really. And he, write, he writes to the chief whip, Tim Renton, who was no friend of Mrs. Thatcher and says, um, uh, I think Heseltine will win next year when there will be a challenge unless, he says, and he says, unless dot, dot, dot. And this was a very interesting document because I was trying to find out what the unless meant. And what it meant, I think, was that the, the top people had to coordinate in a very quiet way to make sure that she did leave if there was a challenge, uh, but she left in a sort of orderly way with their apparent support. Uh, she, she mentioned, you know, like the, the last phrase there from the BBC uh, video docu documentaries, I think it was treachery with a smile on its face. Um, do you think Thatcher was correct about that? Well, of course, treachery is a very harsh word and you could, um, put forward a lot of justifications for what they did. Uh, they were right to think perhaps that um, she'd gone on too long. They naturally wished to consider their own futures. Um, it, they understandably didn't want Heseltine, the assassin, to uh, benefit from the situation. They wanted them, one of their own number, as it turned out, John Major, to benefit. All those are reasonable things, but I think it's not surprising she called it treachery because that is what it must have felt like to her. Here were people who were always telling her she was marvelous and um, were working closely with her. And actually they were uh, rather hoping that she'd be defeated. And when it, when it went badly in the, in the first ballot for her, um, they didn't try to stop her, uh, they didn't try to save her. Um, very much though, very quietly, the opposite. So you can understand why she took that view. And, Politics involves a certain level of treachery, so one mustn't be moralistic about it, but I suppose mm. treachery uh, is what it was. Um, it's a question, of course, is why didn't she see it? Um, and there are various reasons for that, but one would have to be in her character, I think, which is um, the good side of that is that she's always pressing on to do the next thing. She's thinking much more about what will happen next rather than constantly going over and over what might be happening behind her back. And the bad thing is, a sort of hubris by that point, there's no doubt about that. So she was more experienced than everyone left, anyone left in her cabinet. She'd done more, achieved more, um, and she, um, she thought she deserved not to be challenged. 
I did uh, it's slightly remiss of me if anyone is watching uh, and wants to ask a question uh, if you can place it in the question and answer functionality on zoom and we'll get through as many as we can uh, let's press on Charles um, do you think that Michael Heseltine played it well do you think that uh, you know, if he'd have, you know, done this or that different, different early, uh, he may well have become uh, prime minister. Well, Michael Heseltine, who I talked to a lot for the book and was very helpful, um, uh, uh, he played the first half brilliantly, but he hadn't planned the second half. So um, he thought that uh, by a brilliant challenge, he would then be the natural heir, the, nat the natural beneficiary. And as he himself would admit, he misunderstood the psychology of the Tory party. Um, he, had he had provoked and initiated the contest and therefore he could be blamed for its divisive character uh, rather than benefiting from the overthrow of Mrs. Thatcher, which many of them wanted. So the psychologically natural thing for the Tory party to do was to be breathe a private sigh of relief that she was going, but then put in somebody else in her place, not Heseltine. And Heseltine's view, uh, which he formed very quickly was, um, what I should have said after the first ballot result is, fine, uh, um, Mrs. Thatcher's won, though she hasn't won enough to prevent a second ballot. I'm not going to go on to the second ballot. I'm going to loyally um, serve her and uh, we'll go on like that. And then he believes it would have fallen into his lap a few months later. Do you think John Major was just lucky? No, <laughs> I think he was very skillful. Um, and I think he was, uh, in a way, the most skillful of the main um, actors in this drama. Um, and uh, I found two letters from him that he wrote uh, on the fateful night, um, just before she resigned, to Peter Morrison, her parliamentary private secretary, which made clear what he was uh, essentially doing. Um, and what he was doing was trying to succeed her uh, and obviously he wished to succeed her without challenging her, and he couldn't challenge her while he was a cabinet minister. She wanted him to uh, second her nomination for the second ballot. Um, he didn't want to do that because that would rule him out. If she went forward to the second ballot, he couldn't challenge her. But he didn't want to tell her he didn't want to do that because then she would regard that as treachery. So what he had to contrive was a way in which he said he would uh, nominate her for the second ballot, but actually privately made sure that his nomination would not be cashed in. And so there were late night conversations with Peter Morrison to establish this. And therefore, when it was announced that Major would second her, it was on the private unannounced condition that that wouldn't happen and that she would actually go. And so um, he, he, he sort of had it in the bag because then he could say to Thatcherites, well, look, um, I'm her candidate, which was true. She she wanted him of the of those. If she was going, she wanted him, and um, Heseltine is the assassin, um, and so he scooped up the votes both of people who wanted Mrs. Thatcher to go and of people who were furious with Michael Heseltine, and therefore he won. Um, I obviously bought the uh, hardback, um, and um, yeah, it's not just me who thinks uh, this. The, the, the days when she falls, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster, the way that you yeah. write it. Yeah. And I'm sure that it's, you know, partly the material and partly your great skill. Um, is there something that particularly surprised you uh, while you were writing about these days, these particular tumultuous days? Was there something that surprised, that, 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 was, that was new? Well, um the most key bit of information that was new was the major letters that I found, which, which proved, I think, exactly what he was up to and how he very skillfully did it. Um, I think the thing that always does puzzle me, still puzzles me somewhat, is how in the last year of her time, she, um, and in those very last days, people weren't telling her what she needed to know, or possibly she just wasn't listening, or both. Um, and I think I've got the explanation for that, but it still does surprise me the extent to which, um, you know, here are all these people at the top of politics and they don't necessarily really know what's going on. And um, so those who uh, were inclined to support her, and many of them did actually fervently support her, just didn't know what to do about it, didn't know how to coordinate. Um, 
didn't understand uh, what the grassroots of the, not the grassroots of the party in the country, but the grassroots in parliament, the backbenches, what they were, how they were really thinking and didn't understand what colleagues were up to. And in this respect, I think the, um, the people organizing to help her towards the door were very efficient. And, and I don't mean the Heseltine people, I mean the people within the government who were therefore doing it surreptitiously. And the people who were really trying to um, save her were not efficient and um, uh, just didn't think straight. And I, the more I think, as I think over the years, that it is largely the passage of time that makes that happen. If you've won three times and you've been in for 11 and a half years, you do get out of touch and you don't really understand what's going on. And you have become used to people not telling you the truth. And um, then on top of that, you have these massive real issues like the poll tax and what was more important than the poll tax among cabinet colleagues, Europe. And I think there was a very, very deep um, schism on Europe, which has you know, persisted ever after really. And um, Geoffrey Howe said that in his resignation speech and Heseltine said it in his challenge uh, when he stood for the leadership. Um, Europe was their issue, not the poll tax. They'd all more or less agreed on the poll tax. And um, they all had were, were signed in blood, except Nigel Lawson on that one. And, um, and uh, but with Europe, there was a real disagreement and she was really outnumbered. Um, and I think they thought it was, which indeed it was, a very serious matter, whichever view of it you take. And um, so they had a sort of profound impetus for getting rid of her as well as personal one. I think certainly I was marked uh, reading reading these uh, particular pages. Um, you know, when we talk about Europe, um, I mean, it is the reunification of Germany that really sort of like, you know, like, 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 like unstable, destabilizes the cabinet. And, and, and you know, do you, I, I, I mean, even even many of her most fervent supporters thought that she was on the wrong side of history when it came to the reunification of Germany. I mean, first of all, do you do you agree with that point of point of view? And secondly, do you think that you know once Germany had re reunified and once you had that huge new beating heart of uh, independent Germany in the center of uh, Europe, that what happened was that in effect on foreign policy, Margaret Thatcher is no longer needed after the fall of the Berlin Berlin Wall uh, as well. Um, I think that's a pretty good analysis. And I think one of the problems with Mrs. Thatcher was that she was very viscerally anti-German and therefore expressed herself in ways that, um, you know, people couldn't associate themselves with. She once took me aside at a party as if she was telling me a secret. And she said, um, you know, what's the matter with Helmut Kohl? So I said, no, no, what's that? She, she said, he's a German, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which uh, I was aware of. And, um, and uh, this was visceral. But I think to be fair to her, she had noticed something very important about how Europe was changing. Um, she was first of all, right to be worried about the reunification of Germany, though not to, not to hate it, because there was a real danger that Gorbachev would be overthrown and the hardliners would come back in the Soviet Union. And, and indeed that did happen, but then they failed too. Um, that was a serious issue. Also, the price of unification was European Union in a form which she felt was dangerous. And in particular, at that time, the key issue was the coming of the single currency, what's now the Euro. And she was absolutely right that the French and um, government and the law, and in a way, Cole, agreeing to um, the idea of the Euro was considered to be a way of tying German, <coughs> excuse me, a way of tying Germany down. It was actually, she said this at the time in private to Mitterrand, a way of giving Germany the greatest power in the European community, because the whole financial structure would be built around Germany and economic structure. She's right about that. And she was right about how um, uh, the reunification of Germany combined with the single currency would mean that Germany became top dog um, in Europe and that Britain would find it very hard to accept that sort of united Europe or that sort of European Union. So she was simultaneously behind the curve in not accepting too readily enough um, uh, the reunification and in front of everybody else in seeing what was going to happen later. How fascinating. I mean, these are these are the big issues, right? <laughs> you yeah. know, the, uh, extraordinary stuff. Um, 
Now, many, many years ago, when I was coming up under Peter Hennessy out at Queen Mary, I remember um, Robin Butler talking to Peter um, about um, how uh, the, the, the way that Thatcher fell, in effect, was a real lesson for all of us, not least uh, future prime ministers, uh, that no matter how electorally successful and powerful you may be, you can fall. And it's, it, 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 I mean, when you, when you really think deeply about this, and it's only just three years after she wins her, her third election with a huge majority, um, and, she's, and she's out. Do you think that, do you, uh, do, would, you, would you buy into that sort of analysis that this is one of the great moments of sort of like British, British history for that particular point? I would, I would uh, with that, and I would, say that um, <clears throat> it's very two-edged because um, on the one hand it's an excellent thing in a parliamentary system that the leader can be thrown out. You, you can't have a situation, uh, it's not like a, 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 an elected president where who ought to serve a term because they're head of state. If they can't satisfactory command a majority in the House of Commons anymore they should be out and they all need to be reminded of that. On the other hand <clears throat> if there's something frivolous looking or nasty looking about the expulsion of a leader, particularly a great leader, this does fantastic damage to um, the party that's done it, uh, and perhaps to the body politic. Um, and I think both of those things, both, both the good and the bad, were illustrated in the fall of uh, Mrs. Thatcher. It also tells you something about her psychology. I, I saw her not long after she left office, and she said she was writing her memoirs. And I said, what are you going to call them? And she said, undefeated. And the reason for that was that she was. You see, she won every single general election when she was leader, and she won the leadership election, which caused her to resign. People forget that, but she won it. And, um, and the good trick quiz question is, who got the largest number of votes in the Tory leadership election of 1990? Answer Margaret Thatcher, because she got more votes in the first ballot than John Major did in the second. So you see it from her point of view, She's thinking, what on earth has happened? I've won everything. Everything you've ever asked me to win, I've won. And you've got me out. So you can see why it's such a trauma. And obviously that's mainly a trauma in her heart, but it actually is a trauma for the Conservative Party and uh, caused tremendous um, trouble for many years afterwards. Now, I'm just, a, I'm just a layman when it comes to world affairs. I'm a layman in uh, any sense. Um, but I, one of my sort of like shorthand ideas of, you know, bear with it for a, for a moment, Charles, uh, about the Arab Spring was that moment when it looked like uh, that one generation was about to hand on to another and uh, the people revolted. Um, I always sort of like, you know, be, uh, not, not being in those sort of uh, circles at the time, um, I always sort of like thought that when in 1989 she had her 10th anniversary and there was the singing of 10 more years, 10 more years, I always thought that that was one of the key moments that a lot of people around her went, not a chance. <laughs> Is there something in that uh, about this idea that she was saying that she was going to go on and on and on? Yes, and she said it because, um, well, possibly she did really want it, but also because you can't say you're going because then people bring that forward. But I think you're right that people did not like the idea of her going on and on and on. And the, the most important person who didn't like it was Dennis, her husband, because he said to her privately in the, in the May 89 celebrations of the 10th anniversary, you should now go. And she actually agreed with him, but I don't think she really agreed, but she said, yes, yes, you're right. and um, uh, and um, sort of made as if she might do something about it. But then she started making excuses about how the queen wouldn't want it because it would be difficult at some particular moment for some invented reason and <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, knowing full well that she could speak of the queen's opinion without fear of contradiction because nobody could prove it. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and of course she didn't want to go and you know she wouldn't listen to Dennis, she certainly wouldn't listen to anyone else. Now you, you knew Margaret Thatcher and she asked you personally to write her authorised biographies. Um, you've also spoke about the, the rough and tumble of politics. Let's not be a bit too, let's not be too precious here. You know, at the, at the very top of the game, this is hard stuff. Even so, uh, while you were writing this, did you, did, did you feel, feel for her? Was there, was there a degree of emotion there? Oh yes, oh yes. Because um, 
she had worked so hard and done so much and given so much. I think she, you know, she gave a great deal to the country. And to be sort of politically killed in this way, and particularly in this way, I mean, it wouldn't have mattered nearly so much if it had been a general election defeat. Felt fundamentally unjust. And one does sympathize her, and I did sympathize with her very much indeed on that. And I do think there's an element of the sex difference here too. I do think it's important that she was the one and only woman. Um, it meant that she was outside the workings of the club, which was very powerful in those days of uh, male Tory MPs. And she didn't know what they thought. And they often sort of mocked her. And um, there was a sort of collective cruelty there uh, and a collective isolation of her, which um, was tragic really and which cut her deeply. And she was very brave about it. So she always was very brave, but she was also very hurt. And I think when you saw, you see this, um, you know, wounded beast, that's, uh, that is a shocking thing. Now, my final, my final question, well, not quite. I'll, I'll ask you to wrap up uh, afterwards. Last week, we had um, Lord Adonis giving uh, a lecture on 100 years since uh, Roy Jenkins was uh, born and looking at his life. And uh, one of the things that I particularly like is uh, Roy Jenkins' um, biographies um, of uh, Gladstone and Churchill. And there's a point in there where Roy, uh, Roy mused on the idea that uh, when he started uh, writing about Gladstone, he was in no doubt that that was the greatest specimen of humanity ever to occupy number 10. But that by the time he'd finished the book on Churchill, actually, uh, it was Churchill who was, the, who was the real big, biggest of beasts. Now, you, you've known many leaders, uh, you know many leaders, and you've thought about this deeply. Um, where would you rank Thatcher? Now you've finished your three. Uh, where would you rank Thatcher since the Second World War? Well, the, the novelist um, Philip Hensher um, wrote a, a novel called Kitchen Venom, which was based on his um, experience of being a young clerk in the House of Commons at the end of the 1980s. And, there's a, and so Mrs. Thatcher is seen a little bit in the, in the novel um, and from the, that sort of point of view of, a, of, an, of an underling, as it were, and they're discussing it. And one of them says, she's the only one that's remarkable. Um, and I think that's the thing. Um, she could be terribly wrong, she could be terribly difficult, um, uh, she made great mistakes, as well as great positive achievements, but she was truly remarkable. And um, that's testified to by the fact that people are still so interested in her, that she's still well famous, that she's, you know, features in the crown just as it comes out now, um, um, and that she was the first and only woman. She, um, she broke through so many ceilings, um, so there, and this was this sort of um, electricity about her. Um, so it seems to me perfectly clear that um, she was by far the most important post-war prime minister, um, though Attlee would be very important in many of his actual actions. I think in terms of both her actions, her ideas and her character, she was clearly the most important. And actually I would also say the most successful by which I don't necessarily mean she was right, I mean that she simply won more often and bigger and achieved more of what she wished to do than any others. Blair, I think, won even bigger majorities but achieved less, um, though he certainly achieved something. Um, uh, but I think in the normal criteria by which one judges success in politics, she was the most successful. And just before we come to uh, the uh, questions, of which there are many, um, you know, why, why could you just wrap up for me? Why does this matter? Why does the fall of Thatcher matter 30 years on? Partly because it's a great drama and it was the end of an era. Um, partly deriving from that, as from the whole of her career, is the sense that the government of this country really mattered under her. And so what you have in those 11 and a half years and the dramatic end to them, is a story of real importance. And I think one of the things we're wrestling with now is that so many things seem very unimportant, or at least if they're important, nobody seems to be able to do anything about them. Um, and so the confidence in leadership now um, is so much weaker than it was then. 
her leadership came under tremendous challenge and some of that challenge was correct, but nobody could call that leadership negligible. Um, it was very remarkable. And so when people are studying history, they turn to it as they do in other characters in British history, you know, whether it's Elizabeth I or Wellington or Gladstone, um, big, big things, um, Cromwell, it becomes sort of mythological. And I think Mrs. Thatcher understood that because one of the things she had as well as this tremendous hard work and application was she was much more imaginative than people think. She had a sort of romantic idea about her country and about what could be done with it and about how to perform as a leader. And I think she's captured the historical imagination. Thank you. Okay, we'll turn to the questions. We'll get through as many as possible. Lloyd Rees asks, uh, Lord Moore mentioned that those around Thatcher were fed up of her, but was the country, could she have won a fourth election? <laughs> um, I, <laughs> thank you, it's a good question. The people who were trying to get, the colleagues who were trying to get Mrs Thatcher out would always say that, you know, they thought she was, they were frightened that she would lose the next general election for them. But sometimes I say, partly in joke, I think they might have been frightened that she'd win the next election because <laughs> then she really would have been unassailable and it really would have been sort of rather terrifying. Um, uh, I never like to speculate on um, what an actual result would have been. And I do um, fundamentally think that it was time for her to go. Um, but I think lie, behind your question lies, lies the idea that she had not lost all traction in the country. And I think that's true. And opinion polls showed that, and they showed it particularly in relation to Europe. So while she was extremely unpopular in the country about the poll tax, she was not unpopular about Europe. And I think that tells you something about what happened next. Uh, James Heal of the Mail on Sunday asks, did Neil Kinnock fluff the occasion, as he did during Westland, by calling a no-confidence vote, which gave her a virtuoso exit and united the Tories? Uh, yes, is the simple answer to that. Um, in, in, in Robert's introduction, um, uh, Neil Kinnock is, said that um, with her departure, Labour had lost its best asset. That's a tremendously um, mistaken analysis of um, the effect of Thatcher. And I think it, the fact that Mr Kinnock uh, thought that um, showed why they kept on not winning. The first Labour leader to understand, and he told me a lot about this um, for my book, about the power of Thatcher and her power to take Labour votes was um, Tony Blair. And he, he firmly believed, it was one of his biggest beliefs about reforming Labour and leading Labour, that they had to understand what a successful leader Thatcher was in order to understand how they could win. And I think Neil Kinnock always thought, no, no, she's a bad person. We, our rhetoric will carry through and explain to people why she's a bad person and we'll, we'll win. Blair said, no, that's not how it works. She's a very remarkable, innovative leader who touches a lot of chords with natural Labour voters. What we have to do is to separate the good bits of her and learn from her leadership, jettison the bad bits, and as it were, suck the Thatcher effect over to us. Um, and that's what he did pretty successfully. Uh, one of our current students, Donald Beaton, asks, uh, why do you think that Mrs. Thatcher promoted John Major when on the face of things he was relatively inexperienced? Does she regret her decision in retrospect? Um, well, John Major was a very able young minister, a successful chief secretary to the treasury. Um, and he was not at least apparently um, an anti-Thatcherite. She indeed thought he was a Thatcherite, though that wasn't the case. Um, she was right to be looking in the new generation. Major, along with Chris Patton, uh, Allgrave, Ken Clark, and things were, were, were um, able people in the next generation. So it was natural that Major should rise. But I think she certainly miscalculated the effect of Major as it pertained to her. Partly because he was her protege, it was natural for him to wish to get out from under her shadow. And I think to resent her, and I think he did resent her. And after, after she left office, of course, he had cause to resent her because she behaved pretty badly towards him um, uh, later on. Um, so as is often the way when you promote people who are your favorites, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily help you. I think Walpole it was who said, defined gratitude as a lively sense of favors to come. 
and um, once uh, <laughs> uh, once the favours were no longer to come, but had come, um, Major um, wasn't so keen on Mrs Thatcher. Okay. Uh, our old friend Alan Evans, who asks, Thatcher only fell four votes short from winning the first ballot. Had she had a more effective campaign manager than Peter Morrison, she would, have, she would almost certainly have won. What might have happened then? Would it simply just have delayed her inevitable departure and enhanced Labour's electoral chances? Well, thank you. I, as I've said before, I'm, I, I'm always hesitant about the what ifs. I don't think historians can answer them with the authority they claim. But you're perfectly right that um, uh, it was so close that a better campaign you could, should surely, could surely have carried her over the line um, and prevented a second ballot. That, and particularly if she hadn't gone to Paris, I think. Um, but um, where would that have got anybody? It might have got her a breathing space. It might have got her the capacity to wait until the end of the Iraq war, which was just coming uh, to win it and then gracefully go. But it wouldn't have saved her. It might have been better for her and the party, but it wouldn't have saved her. Now, uh, forgive me if you've mentioned uh, uh, something, something here, but um, did she have an idea of how long she actually ideally wanted to stay? I mean, was it truly on and on and on? Or was it like 1996 or get through to like the end, you know, a full, a full fourth term sort of thing? I mean, was there any... I, I, <laughs> I think that, I think that really um, it was just, you know, the equivalent of um, Augustine's famous Lord make, Lord make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> so um, uh, <laughs> she accepted that she would one day have to retire, um, but not yet. Um, Tony Brophy asks, what advice would you give Boris Johnson now learning the lessons of Thatcher's downfall, given the current threats to his position that might prevent him from a similar fate as Thatcher's? Well, the situations are very different because he's only he's only a year into his um, leadership um, since the last election. So those are the most tremendous ructions going on at present, and everybody's at at, uh, at loggerheads, and the situation is very bad with COVID and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's not at all like the fall of Thatcher. He's had eighteen months and only one year since the election. She's had eleven and a half years. Um, uh, so I think that's a really important difference. And in that sense, he is more secure than she was uh, at that at the time of her fall. Um, however, where I think Boris has uh, not done well in this, well, there, are, there may be more than one thing, but this particular thing was like her is, uh, uh, and it started at the beginning rather than the end, is a, is a loss of contact, a loss of contact with MPs, uh, Tory MPs. and. Um, this, of course, is partly not Boris's fault because of COVID. They're simply not physically there to a very large extent. Um, but it's a really difficult thing. And he's never been good at cultivating the House of Commons. He didn't really come up through the House of Commons like Mrs. Thatcher did. Nobody worked harder than she at knowing the House of Commons, though she wasn't really a natural House of Commons person, in, as she rose in her career. Boris, not like that at all. And the, the lack of system and organisation now in in the party about how to use your MPs in the right way and make them feel better is, is quite alarming, I think. And in that way resembles a fag end of an era rather than the beginning of one. Really interesting. We were lecturing this week on uh, the fall of Edward Heath, and there's a really intriguing sort of link there around losing touch with the party. Uh, being captured by the Treasury or the Civil Service or whatever, you know, really interesting. Very um, much, yeah. Uh, yeah. John, John Rentoul of The Independent and one of our visiting professors asks, uh, uh, for the, um, uh, one of the big uh, points of the third book, one of, for, for, for Whitehall watchers, uh, is the bust up between Robin Butler and Charles Powell. Um, could, you, could you just comment a bit further on that, please? Yes, this was something that um, I basically discovered. It was a little bit known about before, but largely with the help of Robin Butler, actually, and indeed Charles, but particularly Robin, because um, he had he'd uh, showed me some paper about this which had never been seen before. Um, I was able to understand better what had happened, um, and 
basically, uh, Robin and um, Patrick Rice at the Foreign Office were desperate to get rid of Charles Cole from Number 10 because he'd been, in their view, far too long as her Foreign Affairs Private Secretary. He'd been, I think, um, by this time, five years when normally you do three and had this extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily powerful, quite a mil relatively junior position, but he was extraordinarily powerful. And um, he'd sort of uh, rather reluctantly agreed to go. Mrs. Thatcher had agreed. They'd lined up an embassy for him, Madrid, which I think perhaps wasn't quite good enough, um, certainly not in the view of Carla, his wife. But um, uh, uh, the, the real key player here was Mrs. Thatcher, who at the last minute really, really didn't want him to go. Because what I think Robin hadn't quite taken in, actually, he would admit this, was that this coincided with the Madrid, so-called Madrid ambush when Geoffrey Howe and Nigel Lawson were ganging up on her about going into the ERM. And so she felt she was being betrayed on all sides or attacked on all sides, that her two most senior cabinet ministers were trying to force her to what would have ultimately lead to the single currency, and that uh, the cabinet secretary and the permanent secretary, the foreign, under secretary of the foreign office, were trying to tell her who she who she could employ in her office and get rid of her most important advisor, Charles Pohl. And so it was the most tremendous row, fantastic ructions. Um, and um, Robin threatened to resign, um, and uh, quite nearly did, I think. Um, and I think he would perhaps admit, I would, I would say he did mishandle it because when you when you make that sort of um, threat and you don't fulfill it, you 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 your position's weakened. Uh, and it would have looked quite odd if he had resigned. So he perhaps shouldn't ever have made that threat. Anyway, the long and short of it was that Mrs. Thatcher succeeded in keeping Pohl, um, but at a high cost because though he was an absolutely brilliant advisor to her, it reinforced the idea that he, Bernard Ing, and one or two others were really running the government and everybody else was excluded. So it sort of added to the, added to the problem. Let me ask my own question, a follow-up question uh, there. One of the um, uh, really interesting points uh, I find uh, for uh, our new professor, Ed Balls at uh, King's, uh, talking about the, um, the, 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 the incredible sort of full spectrum support for joining the exchange rate mechanism in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, that just about everyone was in favour of it, um, apart from Margaret Thatcher. Um, and it, it, it's slowly dawning on me, because I'm not very fast, is that actually she was right. Would you agree with that? Well, I, I can honestly and uh, truthfully boast that I was dead against it at the time too, and <laughs> I wrote it in public. Um, uh, and But you're basically right that um, there were people against, of course, Alan Walters, her advisor, fervently against. Um, half were, Yes, so it was half-baked, yes. But the, the fundamental point was, the British politics kept on looking at this question in the wrong way because they kept regarding it as an economic question, which obviously in a sense it is. But of course, that's not what all this is about. It was a political question. And the point was that she well understood and others denied that uh, Delore and co wanted to use it in order uh, explicitly, actually, to um, move forward to the single currency, stage three of Delore. So this was part of European Union. That's where it was leading. And that's why she didn't want it. There were important economic reasons why she didn't want it. But the fundamental reason was a political one, that it would bring about the single currency and that that was trying to bring about union in all forms, political as well as economic and monetary. She was factually right about that, whether or not you support the move towards it. And the, uh, the other analysis was uh, mistaken. Okay, moving on. Hannah Coltman says, first, I would like to thank you, Lord Moore, for your book. It was this that inspired me to look at Thatcher's downfall for my MA dissertation. There we are. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, what do you make of the comparisons between Theresa May and Thatcher, particularly regarding the way May was pushed out over Europe, yet Boris Johnson manages to hang on? <laughs> um, well, thank you for those kind words, Hannah. I um, uh, Mrs. May had a superficial similarity with Margaret Thatcher because she's a somebody coming up through the Conservative Party, uh, um, a woman coming up through the Conservative Party, very serious, very hardworking, very close to the roots of the party, um, and so on. Um, but I think fundamentally different because actually I don't think she knew what she wanted to do. 
um, and I think um, that became apparent. And um, Margaret Thatcher fundamentally did know what she wanted to do. So um, it's true that Mrs. May was sort of brought down by Europe, though I suppose you could actually also say she's brought down by calling the election in 2017 and, and getting such a poor result because it was the lack, the lack of the majority that was doing her in. Um, uh, but the thing is, Mrs. Thatcher might have been brought down by Europe too, but she had an idea about Europe, a very clear idea. It was just that her colleagues didn't agree with it. I don't think Mrs. May did really have uh, such an idea. And therefore it was likely with this tiny majority, majority that she would be pushed hither and thither. And that's what happened. And um, Boris understood that. And he took up very successfully the most basic point, which is we promised the people that they could have the result of their referendum, so we've got to do it. And that was more important actually than whether you're pro Brexit or not, it was the get Brexit done point, which of course still hasn't quite happened, <laughs> we shall see, but um, uh, that really resonated because so, that got Brexit support and it got the support of people who felt that the referendum should be fulfilled even if they didn't agree with the way it had gone. Um, and that gave him the majority that it now has and it gives him a fundamental coherence which unfortunately seems to be lacking in a lot of other aspects of the present government. But um, I think Mrs May was, though with the best public spirited motives, confused about what it was she was doing and she paid the price for that. Um, Gareth Davis of Bayes uh, returns to the, uh, you know, would, would, uh, was there any scenario where Margaret Thatcher would stand down at a time of her choosing, or would she always needed to have been forced out? Oh, well, um, the obvious way to, for her to be forced out was by a general election. That would have been appropriate. It might well have happened. And uh, she would have hated it, but she would have recognised it as wholly legitimate. Um, former student and proud Mancunian, uh, Thomas Robinson asks, it is often said that the departure of Willie Whitelaw as deputy leader had a destabilising effect on Thatcher's premiership, particularly over the cabinet. Given the decreasing median age and nature of her cabinet by 89, 90, how true would you say this is? Um, I think the departure of Whitelaw was important, um, though, I mean, he was getting on a bit and it, <clears throat> it wasn't surprising that he uh, sort of moved towards the door. But <clears throat> you have to remember the history of Willie Whitelaw, which is that he challenged when when she got rid of Heath in the first round of the leadership contest in 1975. Um, uh, Willie then challenged, as did she. And so she beat him. He represented a very different uh, side of the party and very different sort of groupings and social background and so on. And he immediately offered her his loyalty. Um, and essentially, Willie was like the Heineken advertisement. He, he uh, refreshes the parts that um, uh, she couldn't reach. And uh, he, could, um, he could bring to her people who were not her natural supporters. And so while he was a Tory wet, his actual effect was to bolster Thatcher. Because the, the, the critics would, would come to him, his old chum, and they'd say, oh, she's ghastly, she's frightful, oh, it's well, dreadful. And he'd say, he'd more or less say yes. But he'd say, yes, um, uh, I know, I know, I know. You know he, was, he was very repetitive, slightly inarticulate. But he'd say, yes, yes, terrible, 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 but we've got to support her. <laughs> and he would, he'd say things like, um, um, he'd bring people in when there was some piece of difficult piece of legislation. She says, he'd say, she wants this done, she wants this done, she wants this done. I don't know why I have the faintest idea, but we've got to do it. <laughs> and, um, and there was a sort of, um, he, he brought in the old regimental aspect of the Conservative Party, where you felt, look, she's the leader, you've got to follow her. And he was also good at listening, he was sort of pragmatic, um, and he could sense where there was danger. And uh, from 19, um, I think it's the beginning of 1988, I think I'm right in saying, he, he goes and nobody replaced him. And of course, I think the questioner mentioned the passage of years. She was also, it wasn't just him going, it was also she was much less inclined to listen because um, the passage of years affected her and everyone, almost everyone was younger than she by now and she didn't really know what the younger generation thought and so on. So that greatly contributed to her isolation. <laughs> 
Do you know, it's one of our trick questions when it comes to like exam time, uh, Charles, where we say, uh, examine Margaret Thatcher's style. And the ones who fall into the trap think that she was one, you know, just a continuous sort of, you know, like one Margaret Thatcher. There are so many, right? And this is what your books so wonderfully do is chart the shifts and the, and the, and the ebbing and the flowing. Um, our transcriber of the Strand Group, Susanna Richards, asks, good evening. May I ask, I was surprised to hear that Mrs. Thatcher was possibly quite disparaging about women's suitability for high office. And I wondered whether you think, A, that's the case, and B, that her attitude changed much during her own time in government. It's very interesting, this, and I think um, that wasn't the case. Um, but I think she also felt that the Conservative women MPs in Parliament in her time were not on the whole good enough for the highest office. And this may tell you, this may simply be a fact, but that would be very arguable, yes. Um, I think more to the point, Mrs. Thatcher uh, was very conscious of women rivalry and she didn't like it. Um, and she of course loved being the only woman among all the men. Um, however, and some people call that the queen bee syndrome um, and they don't like it for understandable reasons, but it does not mean that Mrs. Thatcher thought that women as in general were not up to it. In fact, quite the contrary. She based a lot of her most popular political approaches on the idea that women had a better understanding of life than men. And that was really what all her housewife economics was about. She said, the men have tried to pull the wool over your eyes with jargon all these years, but we women know, we know about the household budget. We know about the effect of inflation. Um, and she would use that constantly, you know, holding up a shopping basket and so on to show that women have their feet on the ground in a way that men don't. And also that women are more truthful and less boastful than men. She greatly believed that. And it was a brilliant occasion when um, she went to the 25th anniversary dinner of the Institute of Economic Affairs and she was the last speaker. And she was fed up because they'd gone on and on and on and on congratulating themselves. Um, and so when it came to her, she said, um, uh, I've just listened to six speeches by men. And all I want to say is that the cocks may crow, but the hen lays the eggs. That summed up her view. <laughs> there we go, Susanna. Okay. Um, we've got a very uh, bright uh, uh, recent former student, Luca Ingracia. Uh, who asks, thank you all for such an informative discussion. Lord Moore, how durable do you believe Thatcherism has proven since her downfall? And does the expansion of the state during the coronavirus pandemic threaten to permanently suppress similar small state thinking? Um, I'm thinking a lot about this. and I don't have a, on this last point about um, COVID, and I would only have a rather tentative answer. I think Thatcherism will survive it's not exactly a doctrine it's more like it, it doesn't have a sort of exact theory behind it. it's more like a disposition it's a, a way of approaching politics which mixes doctrine and character um and it's a sort of idea particularly of british history but it wouldn't be confined to britain um and i think it's very powerful um it's to do with opportunity and rising in the world and um greater freedom and um believing in your country rather than more abstract concepts. All those things matter a lot. Um, and she is sort of embodied them. That's why it's called Thatcherism. She's not because she wrote a brilliant theory, it's because she, she was it in some sort of way. And you can learn from studying her life uh, how, how to do that. Um, the COVID has of course reversed, perhaps temporarily, perhaps not, um, many, many aspects of a of a, if you like, a Thatcherized state, as you observe. And um, I suspect that the, in the medium to long term, the effects of that will be to get people more interested in the small state again, because it was the 1970s culminating in the winter of discontent, which made people very fed up with government direction. The British are not profoundly averse to a strong state but it simply grew so much and became so inefficient and um, ceased to work in the late 60s and, and the 70s that they began to look for other ways and Mrs. Thatcher produced those ways. I think uh, 
the way there's a great danger of us going is similar. So we sort of more or less nationalize all sorts of businesses without thinking about them just by handing out so much money to them. And we think that um, the handling of a pandemic is best done by a centralized state. Um, and we get ourselves into strange situations when we actually make it illegal, for example, to go to church or something like that. That's what's happened in this. Um, uh, and um, though people, many people think this is broadly necessary because of the play, obviously very few, few, few people like it. And it's building a habit of um, government control, which is very dangerous and which after this is all, all over, people will revisit and review. And I tend to think they will turn away from it. And when they do that, they will be looking at Thatcherism. Um, our mutual friend, Roger Smethurst of the cabinet office asks, uh, did she enjoy the post office period of her life? Well, thank you and good evening, Roger. It gives me the chance to thank all those in the um, histories unit and uh, um, you for helping me because without all that, I couldn't have studied all these fantastic uh, papers that um, are the government ones. I also studied her own papers, which she kindly gave me free reign to, but these were the government ones, uh, marvelous. Um, I would say that on the whole, Lady Thatcher didn't enjoy her time after office, but um, because first of all, she never quite got over having been kicked out. And she always, what she'd always says, there's so much to do, meaning I want to get back in there and do it. So much to do. Um, and so she felt very frustrated. However, um, she, when she got very old and when her mental powers failed, um, all these feelings diminished and she became rather a sweet old lady rather than a very agitated one. And of course it was terribly sad that um, her powers did diminish and it was frustrating to her. But she became, there was a sort of inner core of Mrs. Thatcher which was very um, simple and was a bit like her own propaganda about being a housewife of a provincial kind and that sort of thing. So for example, she loved talking about how to sew or um, she loved feeding the dog or the cat or she loved having the house <coughs> neat and nice flowers arranged in it and that sort of thing. And those simple pleasures gave her more and more pleasure as she got older and she became a calmer person. And um, there are these very touching scenes of her in old age, going to a park, going for a walk, meeting members of the public, going to Chelsea Hospital where she used to go to church and talking to the pensioners, that sort of thing. And there was a sort of directness and simplicity. In that sense, she never got too grand. She could be bloody terrifying, but she wasn't, she didn't sort of say, run away, little man, I was prime minister. She wasn't that sort of person at all. She would talk to anybody um, in, a, in a rather direct way. And I think she got, the, some of those pleasures um, came through in old age, but essentially she was one of these people constantly devoted to work. Um, and so she couldn't work, that made her angry. A uh, touch of nepotism now, uh, uh, Charles. Uh, manager of the uh, uh, of the uh, Strand Group, Martin, his dad, Ivor Stoliday, asks, uh, in your brilliant biography, you refer to an incident I remember well, as it was much in the news at the time, John Major's disappearance at the crucial moment because of dental problems. Given that you say he was playing a subtle hand, was this convenient? <laughs> um, I think... I think though he was playing a subtle hand, um, he jolly well did have impacted wisdom teeth. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I, uh, there's no question about that. I didn't ask to see um, Sir John's dental records, but I, I believe him. Um, <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, it was, however, convenient. And um, uh, he knew how to exploit that convenience because he understood that it was advantageous not to be there, which is counterintuitive. You'd think, that if all this important stuff is going on and you're not there, um, you are suffering. But actually it made it much easier for him to organize a leadership campaign if, if he couldn't organize it, if it had to be delegated to others, if he could sit there quietly on, on the phone in Huntingdon and get told things by people who were acting on his behalf and it gave it a sort of deniability and um, it was extremely well done. Uh, I've got uh, Andrew, Andrew Heron of the Treasury, who asks, 
what was Thatcher's relationship like with the Treasury, uh, especially over the ERM issue? Was she more the First Lord of the Treasury than other holders of the office? Um, she loved to remind uh, her chancellors that she was <laughs> First Lord of the Treasury. And it's interesting to note that when she was rising in politics, if asked what her highest ambition was, she would always say to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. I think that was partly because she was frightened of saying she wanted to be prime minister in case that sounded too um, absurd because people would have thought at the time, a woman can't make it. But also it was a genuine ambition to be chancellor. Uh, she was fascinated by economic policy and she also felt that as a woman, she wished to conquer things which the men thought they owned and not, they thought they owned nothing more than money and war, that was the other big thing they owned. And, um, so that gave her a, a, a challenge. And that, of course, made her very difficult prime minister for chancellors because she wasn't going to let them um, get on with things peacefully. At its best, it was very dynamic. And that was true of a lot of the chancellorship with Geoffrey Howe and, uh, and the first part of the chancellorship of Nigel Lawson. It was actually rather fantastic because so many things could happen. And there was such a strong understanding in number 10, uh, reasonably harmonious with the Treasury most of the time, not always not on the ERM, um, about um, how to concert these policies. But my goodness, it was dreadful if, if, if um, when the clashes yeah. became endemic and they began over the ERM, they came to the head for the first time in 1985 and they went on forever afterwards until we entered greatly against her will. It showed how powerless she'd become in October, 1990, um, only about six weeks before she resigned. It's a bit of a tragedy with her and Nigel Lawson, I think, because if she had reshuffled Nigel after the 87 election, um, the credit that he would have built up would have been pretty unassailable. And indeed, um, uh, the word she used about him actually, uh, unassailable. Um, but, uh, and, and it would have looked very good for her that she'd chosen such a successful chancellor. Uh, and then he moved, she made him foreign secretary instead of whatever instead of which it all became bitter and sad. And um, uh, this was very much part of the declining years of the, of the last 18 months of, the, um, of her time in office. Uh, Lloyd Rees asks, uh, which of the three volumes did you find most interesting to write? <laughs> huh. Well, of course, as I want you to buy them, if, if you haven't got round to it, I would say that they're all, uh, um, very interesting in their different ways. Uh, um, you can't understand one of them without buying the other two, right? <laughs> um, uh, I think the most difficult one to write is the middle one because it doesn't have um, a, 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 a rise or a fall. It's, it's her zenith. Um, I found the rise absolutely fascinating um, because of her, sort of, as it were, coming from nowhere and the huge amount of discovery I made about her private life and her as a woman and her as a young woman and the immense difficulty she overcame. Um, and the third volume has this tremendous triumph at the end of the Cold War and her third election victory and the tragedy of the fall, um, so full of drama. However, I would say one thing in favor of volume two and it's, and it's a pleasure to, to, to do, was the absolute fascination of how she dealt with the Cold War and Gorbachev and, um, and how she moved from being the hawk almost to the dove. I mean, she didn't really ever become a dove, but this is the funny thing about her, is her, uh, she rather almost sold herself on being rigid and never changing, but that was almost a device for concealing when she was changing. And um, she was quite subtle and she was a good diplomat at a, at a human level. If she was interested in a person like Reagan or Gorbachev, um, she really knew how to play that. And I found that all deeply fascinating and I think it actually matters. Well, following on from that, um, and a late question coming in from Gordon Carrera of the BBC, uh, yeah. who asks, what were the roots of her distrust of Germany? And would she have got on with Angela Merkel? <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Uh, her, um, her roots of distrust of Germany were the war. But um, I actually think that it's something else happened when she came into office and when she became leader leader before she became went into office she was actually very admiring of german economic recovery though she was always aware that the german situation was very different from ours 
and she studied the success of Ludwig Erhard, for example. Um, uh, and she got on quite well with Helmut Schmidt. So I think some of her resentment against Germany that came later was a bit of a cover or a psychological thing. I think what she was really annoyed about towards the end of her time in office was the fact that Germany was beating us and particularly um, beating us, not so much economically actually, um, though there was stuff about that with the stability of the Deutschmark, um, but diplomatically. She was deeply upset by Bush, George Bush succeeding Ronald Reagan. She liked Bush, but when Reagan sort of did the tilt to Germany as seeing Germany as the key to the end of the Cold War, she was deeply upset by this. And she hated the rise of Helmut Kohl as a world statesman, do, bringing about effects which she thought for reasons we've already discussed tonight, dangerous. Um, and Kohl himself, I think, brought out all that anti-Germanism. Um, I just can't imagine her and Angela Merkel. Um, I just don't know what it would be like. Um, uh, <laughs> um, Mrs. Thatcher, on the whole, didn't um, get on well with women politicians. The exception actually is Indira Gandhi, with whom she had a good relationship. But there, I think, um, they enjoyed talking about the problems with their children, um, and um, uh, which were considerable. <laughs> Okay, um, I've got Matthew Lloyd from uh, Queen Mary, a PhD student who asks, is there anyone you believe, Lord Moore, is the true Thatcherite torch holder in the Conservative Parliamentary Party today? Well, what I always think about this is um, that, I'm slightly evading the question, but um, I don't think the best Thatcherites are those who simply repeat her doctrines as if nothing had changed because what she was, was a change bringer, rather than trying to produce a steady state. And I think some ardent Thatcherites don't understand that. So they just sort of look up the book of Thatcherism, as it were, and say, um, we must do what she did. That's not how politics works. And she understood that, but some of them don't. So it could be that um, a successful Thatcherite in modern times, um, uh, would not necessarily share quite a lot of her views, but somehow they would share the essential spirit of them. Um, I'm not sure that such a person is apparent right now um, in the absolute uh, front rank. I mean, I think Jacob Rees-Mogg is very good at articulating many aspects of it, but if you're thinking about people who are actually deciding what we're really doing at the top of the government, it's not clear to me. Um, one thing I would say, one Thatcher dictum I would, pass on to Boris, and it's one that he doesn't always pay much attention to, is one of her favourites, um, time spent in reconnaissance is never wasted. <laughs> uh, look, I'm going to draw it to an end, but I'm going to ask Robert, uh, who I think has got uh, a last question. Robert, over to you. Um, hello, can you hear me, John? Yes, thank you, Robert. Yeah. Sorry, my, can't uh, you. Two, two very quick questions. I mean, a fascinating discussion, Charles. I'm, Fascinated to hear it all. Two quick questions. In the in the later years, I covered the Lords as well as the Commons, and Geoffrey Howe had been obviously very close to Thatcher, a political soulmate for years. When he made that speech, he turned to Ken Baker and said it was a mixture of bile and treachery. He, in effect, began the process that brought her down. Yet years later in the Lords, I saw them having what looked like a friendly conversation next to each other in the Lords. So my question, first question is, did she ever forgive Geoffrey Howe? And my second brief question, in the crown, spoiler alert for those who haven't got to the end yet, but there's an extraordinary scene where in one of the private audiences with the Queen, Margaret Thatcher in the middle of the leadership crisis, crisis asks the Queen to dissolve Parliament so she can call an election and save her bacon. Is there any basis whatsoever for that? Um, to answer your second question first, none whatever. Um, uh, Mrs. Thatcher did occasionally um, invoke the Queen, as I mentioned briefly, in trying to avoid leaving. <laughs> um, uh, but this was more, so she might do this in relation to the coming Iraq war as a reason why there shouldn't be a leadership contest. But no, absolutely, she would have known at, at once that it was wholly unconstitutional and dotty. It wouldn't have helped her anyway um, if the Queen were to dissolve Parliament. And I think it's a very bad mistake by the Crown because first of all, it's absolutely untrue. And secondly, um, uh, it shows Mrs. Thatcher in an unbelievable light. And it also um, doesn't make any sense with the Queen either. It doesn't, um, uh, it, it's, I, I can't understand why it's there at all. Um, 
uh, with Geoffrey Howe, it's interesting is about what did she forgive him? Shortly after he'd done what he did and she'd left office, he wrote her a sort of letter of attempted reconciliation, which she rejected. And I'm sure his motives were the best, but it was much too early to write such a letter. Um, and, you know, it was, the wound was much too raw. But what you observed was correct. That, um, I mean, that when you saw them together, that reflected something, which was that later um, uh, they were sort of reconciled. And she, I think I'm right in saying, invited him to her 80th birthday party, for example. Um, and you have to remember that it, one of the sad things about their relationship was it had been very close. And um, rather touchingly, when Jeffrey was old and he himself lost his, um, some of his mental faculties, he spoke to me sometimes about her and he said, when Margaret and I were married, we this, that and the other. And it's interesting that he was, that thought was in a muddled way in his mind. He did feel rather as if they had been married and then they got divorced and that he sort of sought a reconciliation. And, 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 and in a way he got it. I mean, I don't think she ever perhaps fully forgave him, but she, she was no longer angry with him. Well, thank you so much. That brings us to an end. It's the last of the autumn semester too, and uh, this and uh, all the rest of them uh, are, are, are up on our website for you to uh, read and to, uh, and to, and to watch. Um, I've got to tell you, I thought that, that was wonderful. This is the third time, Charles, you've come and spoken about the... Uh, <laughs> um, and um, I, I, I think that this is uh, uh, just a wonderful series of events. Um, a big thank you to Robert for what I thought was an excellent present presentation. And yeah, yeah. Miles, you know, I can't I can't recommend your books highly enough. Uh, I think that they are really quite remarkable. So uh, a huge thank you. And um, you know, we'll raise a glass. You know, no, no, in a in a happier days. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.